so fortunate to be with Mark Fraunmeyer. He's the CEO and founder of Arkimoto out there in Eugene, Oregon, and you are making some pretty exciting vehicles. We're big fans of them on this channel. Can you tell our viewers who may not be familiar with what you're doing, what it is you're doing in that cool factory there? Sure, sure thing, Zach, and thanks again for having me on the program. Uh, so Arkimoto uh, is a company, we're building a super efficient three-wheeled electric vehicle called the Fun Utility Vehicle, the FUV. Uh, I started Arkimoto in 2007, actually almost exactly 12 years ago, with the mission to help catalyze the shift to sustainable transportation. And we're, the, the basic idea is based on the disconnect between cars and how people actually use cars on a daily basis. We drive these five to seven passenger things that can go hundreds of miles, but we typically drive them by ourselves or maybe with another person a few miles to go get a cup of coffee or go to work or go to school or go to the movies or go wherever. That disconnect in terms of the footprint of the vehicle creates just massive inefficiency. We cover our cities, about 40% of our cities are covered with asphalt to move cars around and park them. And yet we still face massive traffic congestion in almost every major metropolitan area. So the idea of Arkimoto is not so much to change your behavior pattern, but it's really about creating the right tool for the job for everyday travel. And so the, the, the vehicle that we, we spent actually about eight years uh, iterating towards this new platform of a vehicle. It's three wheels, two wheels in front, one wheel in back, dual motor uh, electric drive in the front. You, sit, you actually sit astride the battery, so it has a very low center of gravity, super, super fun ride. And yet, uh, even though it's uh, only a little larger than uh, a touring motorcycle, it still fits two big guys comfortably. And that, that really is what differentiates it from other products on the market. It's a small form vehicle with a lot of space. And so our, our first vehicle is a fun utility vehicle. It's focused on consumers, commuters, vacation rentals. But on that very same platform, we're building a delivery vehicle we call the Deliverator. So get rid of the second seat and now you've got a bunch of storage in the back. Uh, and then a rapid response vehicle for emergency services, law enforcement, security, and so on. Those are really exciting. I mean, all three are exciting. Um, the Deliverator seems like it's gonna be a huge hit with you know Uber Eats and all those delivery services because you know it can get around a city so easily and park so easily. The Rapid Responder, I mean, that's I think gonna be a game changer for so many, you know, campus police and first responders, like to be able to get in and out of traffic and get to the scene quickly, that's gonna be amazing. It was actually driving in New York City that where, where we were able to really maneuver uh, across town incredibly effectively that gave us that notion of, well, hey, you know, we could, that's, that's a market where we could actually save lives by getting first responders to accident sites more quickly for, I mean, ultimately everything from parking enforcement to, uh, to mall security and so on. Now, when we uh, are testing things like new e-bikes and new e-scooters, what I find really interesting is that so many people, even though it's, you know, a bicycle with a motor on it, nothing groundbreaking, uh, so many people uh, don't get it. I feel like that's going to be happening with, with the fun utility vehicle. A lot of people might look at it and go, I don't get it but I feel like they have to get inside it. Yeah, once, once you actually take a ride, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty compelling experience. That was what ultimately led us to our go-to-market strategy. If you think about how vehicles are sold today, traditional automotive model is you go to a uh, franchise dealership, they buy cars from a manufacturer, sell them to you. Uh, Tesla was really the pioneer of the direct-to-consumer retail store model. But what we found is when we were driving around in lots of different places, we'd get asked constantly, where, where can I rent that? Did you guys rent that? Did you rent that? And we finally, uh, the, the, the blinding flash of the obvious was, well, let's just open up rental shops in destination markets so that people who want to try it, want to try something really fun in someplace beautiful or at a conference in Vegas or, or wherever, can have an opportunity to actually try it out for an extended period of time that really changes the dynamics of both the, the user experience. You get a real chance to kick the tires, and then from the company's perspective, it, it offloads that cost of uh, opening up test drive outlets where we're, we're just sort of giving away test drives and lets, lets the consumers be a part of that equation. So basically you've got a bunch of people on your list right now waiting for these and it sounds like the wait is coming to an end because uh, you've, you've reached a pretty important milestone. What is that? We let our community know last week that we have completed all of our testing required for certification. And as we speak right now, we are our, our compliance team is, is furiously drafting all of our compliance certificates. And I think by the time this airs, 
uh, we will have actually launched our very first retail production vehicle into the market after 12 years. So let me get this right. You've got a lot of people uh, like myself who are on the pre-order list who must be chomping at the bit to get their fun utility vehicles. How many do you have on the list right now? Uh, we've got more than 4,000 pre-orders. And that's, that's not counting all of our rental franchises that are in the pipeline. Um, it's gonna take us a while to chew through all that. We're gonna obviously start out production, uh, you know, one a day and then two a day, and then uh, aiming to get to five a day in very short order. And then within 18, 12 to 18 months of production start, we wanna be building 200 a week. The quest to get from zero to one is now all but done. And then now it's time to go from one to N. It just must feel so cool to see the raw materials turning into fun utility vehicles at the end. It, it's, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. And the, the way that we've built it, the, the whole idea is to have these sort of functional units within the factory that can each individually be scaled up to meet demand. We have a very simple U assembly line that can just simply be replicated over and over and over to increase production volume. A scale factory would really look like material handling, quality, and then assembly. Uh, and then ultimately relying on a, a whole constellation of suppliers for all of the bits and pieces. The advantage of having all of the, the vertically integrated metal production in-house, particularly as we get started, is that we can both do low volume production up to you know, about 20,000 units a year, as well as very rapidly iterate over new product concepts. And that's really where things like the Deliberator and the Rapid Responder and some of the other stuff that we have uh, waiting in the wings, we can actually move very quickly on that product development process because we can do a lot of the work uh, under this roof. If people are watching and they're like, this looks really cool, I'm gonna maybe go rent it somewhere and try it, you know, do you use a regular driver's license to, to drive it or do you need to get a motorcycle's license? The FUV is technically a motorcycle uh, that's a federal classification, but almost every state now has some kind of a carve out for three wheeled vehicles. And whether the FUV fits in those carve outs or not depends on how they're written. In Oregon, in California, just a normal driver's license is all you need. And I think another 17 states, that's true as well. And we're now going sort of state by state where we have high density of pre-orders and lobbying legislators to add that exemption for, for the particular characteristics of our vehicle. It's got a very flat, very stable ride. And so we found that that's been very persuasive. Just over the last six months, I think we have gotten exemptions in, I wanna say four or five more states. And we expect that as we roll out, you know, our initial, our initial launch is gonna be heavily focused on the West Coast, because that's where we are. But as we roll out nationwide and get units in various states all around the country, that's when we'll really begin those pushes uh, to make sure that it's a very easy process for our customers to operate the vehicle. And I would think this helps most states or all states to get to where they wanna be with, with uh, carbon emissions, uh, because you're hopefully taking a car off the road. And, and, and to that point, we, we just got, and this is, this is still preliminary, but we got our, our urban EPA uh, first numbers and it's looking like we're gonna clock in on product number one out the door at 183 miles per gallon equivalent and just north of 100 miles of range, urban range for that vehicle as well. And, and for, for those of you watching who are like, well, I don't know what that means, 183 uh, miles per gallon equivalent, I mean, look at a Tesla and you're looking at something like 120 miles per gallon equivalent. So, I mean, this is way more efficient than even one of the most efficient cars on the road. That's because I assume it's so light. Right, you, you, you take away two thirds of the weight, it takes away rolling resistance. You're just not pushing anywhere close to as much stuff down the road. And that, what a fantastic range too. I mean, the fact that it's EPA rated range means that this is a very close to real life range. I mean, they're, they're very realistic when they test vehicles. So we're not looking at like what a manufacturer claims it is. This is an actually tested range and for a hundred miles. I, and I should be clear that is, that's our urban range. So that's for the kind of driving that we're envisioning is gonna be the typical day in day out. We'll have continued work to do on aerodynamics. Uh, we, we see opportunities for efficiency improvement in the drivetrain. Our long-term goal is 230 miles per gallon equivalent. We think we'll get there over successive iterations of the product. But I got to say, I'm, I'm incredibly pleased uh, to be north of 180 MPGE on first units out the door. I, it's the mission of the company. It's, it's, it's why we're doing what we're doing. And it's certainly why I've dedicated uh, 12 years of my life to the Quest. Now, for people watching who are also like, well, this looks really fun in my neighborhood. I can picture myself ripping around. But then how do I get it to my friend's house who lives you know, 10 miles away? Can you bring these on the highway? Oh, yeah. No, it's, it, is, it is a motorcycle. It can go 75 miles an hour. It can go on all the roads. I, I think that's w one of the reasons why we developed uh, a motorcycle class vehicle instead of something like a neighborhood electric vehicle 
is that if you have something that's that's capped at 25 or 30 miles an hour, you're really landlocked inside of a, a very small area. I think of this as more of like a community electric vehicle where you can really get anywhere in your whole community. We're not thinking that it's gonna be your long haul commuter. So if you're doing 100 miles on the freeway every day to get to and from work, uh, that's, that's really not the sweet spot of this. But for the typical driver who's doing, and, and I think nationwide, average is 33 miles a day that people are driving. This is just, it's a perfect vehicle for that use. You guys are listed on NASDAQ. You guys are a stock that people can invest in. Um, you go by the ticker symbol FUV, and I'm an investor as well. So everyone, full disclosure, I fully believe in this company. What would you say to investors who've been looking at your, you know, you've been on NASDAQ for quite a while now, but now you're actually producing the vehicles. Uh, what, what's kind of the, the word to investors? The folks that we've talked to, you know, I've been out and about at lots of different industry events and, and conferences and so on. And we've definitely met a lot of people who have been on the fence simply because we were not in production. And when you're not in production, you're not generating revenue. Fundamental investors really can't participate. And this question mark around, well, how long is it really going to take to get through compliance, to get through testing, to get through, uh, to, to get all of the supply chain set up and so on. Uh, now that question, those, those questions are answered. Uh, so this, you know, the, the very large risk associated with an indeterminate go to production time, at least as of we think the end of this week will be answered. And then the next step is, well, you know, what really is the global market opportunity? We think it's very large. Uh, how effectively will we be able to scale production? We think we've set it up so that we can actually scale production quite easily. So, you know, what would I say to investors? Uh, you know, water's great jump on in. Yeah, because I, I think a lot of people, if you are thinking about buying, let's say a golf cart, this is in the golf cart price range. In fact, there's golf carts that go sky high in price, $30,000 I've seen. This thing is so much more fun than a golf cart's gonna be because it's really designed to drive everywhere. It's not just designed for driving around a golf course. So for people out there who are looking for a vehicle that can do so much more than a golf cart and yet it's still all electric, um, this looks like just a perfect solution. And it's one of those ones I think that it's like, why didn't one of the big car manufacturers think of this a long time ago? Like, why didn't they put one of their divisions on this? The one thing that I've seen in the three wheel vehicle space in particular Particular is that if you're at a, a, a major auto manufacturer, motorcycle manufacturer, you have typically been enculturated into that world. And so when we've seen people who are in the auto world go after three wheelers, they look at it as a car. And when you have a motorcycle developer going after the three wheel vehicle space, they look at it more like a motorcycle, like maybe the Can-Am Spider. But we have been looking for something that is a daily mobility solution. And let's just talk about service for a second, because I know a lot of people when they're thinking of buying something, they're gonna go, well, where can I get it serviced? I think it would be good to hear about the fact that it's not like an internal combustion engine where there's gonna be things that need replacing all the time. Can you speak to the service component? Yeah, and we found that that's, that has been true. So, you know, Nissan, uh, I wanna say, uh, they derive about 30% of the revenue from service for their electric vehicles that they do for their gas ones. And then the wear items are the things that any basic automotive outfit can service. Tires and brakes and shocks, those are the principal wear items on the Arkimoto. All of that together means just, a, we think, a dramatically simpler service picture than a traditional car. If I am a local service station and I'm working on ICE cars and I kind of see that the future is electric and I'm watching this video right now, can they reach out to you guys and say, hey, we'd like to partner with you and be like a service uh, center for you? For sure. And if you just, just a simple email to info at arcamoto.com, we'll make sure it goes to the right place. I feel like there's a lot of people out there, we get emails all the time about, you know, Zach and Jesse, uh, the future is electric, but what can I do to prepare for it? Well, if you are into cars, use the skills you already have, your experience you already have, and just work on a slightly different, you know, drivetrain. We see that as a huge win-win. We have the opportunity to bring new customers to an existing business, and then we gain the benefit of geographic coverage for our customers. If someone wants to rent these, I heard you have a couple cool uh, rental things that might be coming down the pike. Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, so, so our, our, our very first rental vehicles are going to be available in California. I'm sorry, but that's so cool to see a, see a fun vehicle just driving behind you. So, uh, you know, they, they actually do drive. That's gonna be an important characteristic of the vehicle. We're planning to have our first uh, uh, rental vehicles available in California, in San Francisco and San Diego. Will be our first uh, rental uh, facilities. So our, our, our rental model, one of the nice things about the, the rental model is that because 
We see it as a profit center rather than a cost center. We believe it is something that will be franchisable. And in fact, we've got uh, now dozens of potential franchisees in our pipeline, franchisee pipeline. And so, uh, you know, I would look for announcements coming up about additional rental locations that we're not gonna be opening ourselves, but we're actually gonna be partnering with folks in market to do those rentals. And to that point, again, if you're you know, a car rental place uh, anywhere in the, in the country, I would think that this would be a smart no-brainer to add to your lineup. Down in, in San Diego County, for example, uh, the, the hotels that we've talked to you know, 10 years ago, about 100% of their guests would show up in a rental car that they got at the airport. Now, about 40% of guests show up in an Uber or in a Lyft. And so where we see the rental opportunity is really in, you know, at the destination point where you're saying, hey, there are a couple of these really cool vehicles parked out in front of the hotel. Why don't I go uh, drive down the, the, the 101 and uh, get, get lunch and go to Legoland or whatever. That's, that's really the way to experience it. And it provides a real benefit for uh, destination locations that want to have something cool to offer their guests. Yeah, because that makes an, an adventure. I mean, Ubering to some locations, one thing, if you just need to get, you know, to the theater or something, but like uh, taking a fun utility vehicle for an adventure, for a ride, that seems like it would just make the whole trip. As a, a, another uh, neat note about that is one of our partners down, our partner in San Diego, a group called Hula, which stands for High Utilization Local Access. They're planning on taking their rental vehicles that they're renting out to vacationers during the day and then renting them out again in the evening to delivery drivers who are delivering for you know Grubhub or Uber Eats or whatever. I'm super excited. And now the fact that these are momentarily probably gonna be rolling out the door. I mean, by the time this goes to air, they're probably going to be rolling out the door. Uh, that's super exciting. I, I echo that sentiment entirely. Thank you to you and your whole team. I know it takes a whole team of people to do this, but it was your vision from the beginning and uh, you stuck with it. And I just, that's such a inspiring message for, for me and I think a lot of other people who, you know, you, you fail, you fail, you fail, but you just, each time that you had some kind of obstacle, you just got back up and you kept going. It's been years, but you now have reached the point where you've got a major success. Well, well Zach, thank you. It's, uh, it has definitely been a journey uh, from the beginning. I, I, I thought it was gonna take six months to get to a retail product coming out of the software world, and it's taken 12 years. But, uh, but we're here. That's so awesome. Well, congratulations, guys. I can't wait to uh, get in one myself. Um, I'll, just keep, I'll just keep lobbying you until I finally get one, I guess. But I know that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm down on the list a little ways. I know we, we got to get the first people there as first. And, uh, and thanks, thanks again for having me on the program and for, for helping tell the story. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Mark.